it's a linear relationship if there's a common difference. It's exponential if there's a common ratio. All right, so common difference is talking about from one term to the next in a sequence of values that you're always adding the same number, All right? Common ratio is saying from one term to the next in the sequence you're multiplying by the same number, all right? So in the first case, it's saying there's no interest involved, and we're gonna learn about interest uh, in this lesson, but, uh, but for now, you can just say it's a percent of increase in value, all right? But we'll clarify that more later, all right? Uh, but you're getting $825 a month, so you kind of you don't have to write this out, but you would you would just ask yourself, am I multiplying by eight hundred and twenty five every month, or am I adding eight hundred and twenty five every month? So if you kind of play it out, start off with zero dollars in the beginning. Somebody gives you eight hundred and twenty five dollars. Then the next month they give you another eight hundred and twenty five dollars. So we're adding the second eight hundred and twenty five to the first. Then we're going to add another 825, and then we're going to add another 825, depending on the number of months that pass. All right, so that's an example of a common difference. So there's a linear model with a common difference of 825. All right. The second one, the value of the house increases by 1.5% per year. All right. So if we're going to increase by 1.5%, that's going to be a multiplication uh, relationship. All right. So you got to kind of think about okay, how is that going to play out? So if I start off with, let's say, I mean, this is a, a very, very simple or even simplistic example, but let's say the value of the house was one dollar. All right. So what we would do is take that one dollar. All right, take that one dollar and multiply it by point zero one five. All right, the percent in decimal form. That would give us the amount by which the value increased. So the new value after the first year would be 1.015. Then that value is going to increase by 1.5%. So we would take that number and multiply it by 0 0.015. And this is the number that would get added on to the, the previous value. All right. You might remember this from middle school, but the shortcut for a percent increase was to multiply by 1 plus whatever the percent is. All right, so if I had, for example, I don't know why I just said, I gotta figure that out at some point. But if I have, let's say sales tax and it's 8%, if I wanna figure out the total amount of money that I would have to pay for an item, I would just take the list price and multiply it by 1.08, right? And that would give me, bless you, the price plus the sales tax. The one representing 100% of the original cost and the 0.08 being the additional amount associated with the sales tax, all right? So that's really what's happening here. We would start off with the initial value, multiplied by 1.015, and then repeat that process over and over again, all right? So end repeat. That's an example of an exponential model with a common ratio of 
1.015. Right. So they ask, is it linear or exponential? But the justification is by telling what the common difference is and what the common ratio is. You can't really just say it's a linear model because there's a common difference. Like you could very well be guessing. You got basically a one in two chance of getting it right. They want, they want the common difference value also to show that you really know what you're talking about. Right? Same thing with the common ratio. Right? Uh, every year the alligator population is nine sevenths of the previous year's population. In elementary school, you learned that of is a key word for multiplication. Right? So if we start off with the initial population and multiply by nine over seven, and then multiply by nine over seven again, and again, and again, and again, we can determine the population, assuming the trend holds many years down the line, right? So this is another exponential model, but this time with a common ratio of nine over seven. All right. Now, a good question, uh, only because I, I would ask this question, so it must be a good one. No, um, it just comes to mind. Why did I add a one to the previous one, but not this one? It's a good question. All right. The key word is increase. If they give you the percent of increase, that's telling you that that percentage is on, on top of the previous whole value, which is 100%. So 100% plus the 1.5%, all right? Whereas in this case, the nine sevenths is not an increase, that's just a new population value, all right? Also, you could kind of look at it as nine sevenths, if you put it in decimal form, it wouldn't be the nicest looking decimal, but it would be a value over one, all right? So the one would represent the previous population, the additional decimal value would be the percent increase, all right? Temperature increases two degrees every 30 minutes from eight to 3.30 each day for the month of July, right? Increases by, right? So it's logical to assume that if you start off with a temperature of let's say 50 degrees, that 30 minutes later, it would be 52 degrees. 30 minutes later, it would be 54 degrees. It's increasing by a constant value. And so therefore there would be a common difference of two degrees, right? So we're looking at a linear model with common difference of two degrees. Now this one is kind of, it's kind of a trick question because it depends on how the units of time are defined. Because normally when we talk about a common difference, we talk about for every one unit in the X direction. 30 minutes, if you think about it in terms of hours, that would only be half a unit in the X direction, right? But if you're thinking of 30 minutes as one unit, one set of 30 minutes, right? Then you could define your variable such that each unit along the X axis represents a 30 minute block of time, right? So depending on the wording of a problem like this, it could get a little weird. If it, if the units of time are minutes, then you would actually have to take that two degrees and divide it by 30, and that would be your common difference. All right? If the units of time were hours, you'd have to take that two degrees and multiply it by two to get to standardize it into the, the appropriate units. All right? Same idea for number five, every 240 minutes. Like, are those hours? Like, are, are we defining this in terms of hours? They, they left it vague so we get away with it. But for a question that says, right, uh, with the unit of time being in hours, what would be the common ratio? Right. Now here it's saying, I mean, it's a little morbid, but one third of the rodent population dies. Right. So that sounds like a decrease. Right. So just like with increase, we added one to whatever the percent value was. 
Here we want to take the percent value or the, the, the fractional value and subtract it from one. All right, so it is exponential. with the common ratio of one minus one third, which would be two thirds. All right. So that one was the previous population. That one third represents the the amount of decrease, all right? So the proportion of decrease. All right, so previous population is the one. Now you're like, one, How, there was only one rodent and only one third of it died? No, it's that one represents a percent value. So 100% of the previous population, let's say there was 100,000 rodents, that one, there was 100% of the 100,000 rodents. So all of those rodents. Then we're removing from that population one third, so about 33%. So only 67% approximately remains, right? It's the difference between procedural and actually understanding what what these numbers are telling us because most people will say all right oh, so i'm i'm just adding the same number every time i'm multiplying the same number every time okay good got it but to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it that's the important piece all right which brings us to a formal definition of exponential growth and decay all right a represents the initial amount R represents the rate of growth of rate of growth or decay. You'll notice that the equation has a plus or minus in it. It's plus if you're dealing with growth. It's minus if you're dealing with decay. So plus for growth. and minus if it's the K. So it's not like um, quadratics where you have to do bo both the plus and the minus and come up with two separate answers. Here you decide whether it's plus or minus based off the context of the situation, All right? Now, that rate is in decimal form. All right. Then T represents time with units consistent with the rate. It's a weird way of defining it. It's just that the units of time change depending on how the rate is measured, all right? So time is not always in seconds, minutes, hours, whatever. Sometimes it's in years, sometimes it's in decades, all right? It all depends on what they tell you the units are for the rate. If they say the units for rate are um, 1% per month, all right? An incre increase of 1%, whatever it is, per month. The per month part tells you the units of time, right? Per month means time is measured in months, all right? So we always look to the rate to tell us what units of time we should be working with. Typo for somebody. Um, I would imagine you probably would need a little bit more space for number one than what I gave there accidentally. So uh, get on that. A three bedroom house, and well, we're gonna do the problem anyway, but we'll have to squeeze it in there. A uh, three-bedroom house in Exponential City was purchased for 190000 The housing prices are expected to increase 1.8% annually. Annually is another way of saying per year, right? So the units for time are years in this problem. Write an equation that models the price of the house in T years, right? Sometimes they just flat out tell you what the units are. 
using your answer, find the price of the house in five years. All right, so we're using this model, y equals. Now, FYI, that y can also be written as y of t, all right, because we're typically looking at the exponential growth decay model as a function of time, all right? We could also make it a function of rate, so it could be in certain circumstances y of r, but that's less typical, all right? So they're telling us what the initial value is, so that's a. They're telling us that it's expected to increase at a rate of 1.8% annually. So that's giving us R equal to 0 0.018. The increase part, that's a measure of growth. All right, so we have the A, we know that it's a plus sign, and we also know the R value. We don't know the T, but they said to write it in terms of time, so that's fine, all right? So my function here, I'm gonna write it as Y of T is gonna be equal to 190,000 times one plus .018 to the T power, all right? So in the do now problems, we had to kind of infer certain circumstances would require a one plus to come up with a common ratio. Here it's built into the equation so we don't have to worry about it, all right? So the second part of the problem is find the price of the house after five years, or in five years, sorry. That's why I wrote it as y of t, because now I can say, using appropriate notation, y of five is gonna give my answer. So I don't have to write the whole equation all over again. All right, so y of five is gonna be the result, and that's all calculator work, all right? You'll find that this section is pretty much all calculator work, all right? So you can do this a couple of different ways, all depending on what other things you would need to do with this scenario. If you have to create a graph, then you're probably gonna do it this way. So I'm gonna show you, I'll show you the two ways. All right, one way is just typing this expression in and replacing the t with a five. But the other way is to look at it graphically. So I would type in 190,000 times one plus 0 0.018 raised to the x power. All right, um, so something to be mindful of. It's, it's just another term. Exponential functions, they're, they're also known as transcendental functions, and the reason they're called that is because they transcend ordinary algebra. They have other algebraic, other rules that, that apply to them that go beyond algebra, right? It's kind of a beginning to other types of functions, non-algebraic functions, right? So most of these problems need to be solved with a numerical approach. So even if a question tells you to do it algebraically, it's only going to take you so far before you need to get a calculator involved, right? So basically for all of these problems, you're going to need a calculator at some point, all right? So I hit enter to lock it in. I could do this one of two ways. Go to the table, look for the number five, see what that gives as a Y value. That's probably the most straightforward approach. Um, it, it kind of falls flat if you have to plug in a weird number. Like if they said find the price of the house after 7.125 years, you're not gonna find 7.125 in the X list. You'd have to modify your table settings, which sometimes is more trouble than it's worth. But we have the value here. Now we have to worry about any kind of rounding instructions that are given, all right? So the general rule of thumb here is round to significant, uh, three significant digits unless you're told otherwise in the problem, all right? Even if you think you know what the units are supposed to be, just go to three significant digits unless they say round to the nearest dollar. So they just said find the price of the house in five years. So 207.726.781. All right, so you report that value 
And then if you want to get a little bit more specific to the to the, the framework of the problem, you could say that that's approximately in terms of dollars 207726.78. All right. Cuz I I I could never stand the argument of like well you can't have point seven eight one dollars. Like it, it, it's just infuriating because there's so there's so much wrong with that. Uh, all you need to do to refute that one is just go to any gas station and just look at how they represent the prices. It's five dollars and twenty nine cents and nine tenths afterwards. There's a, they always have that fractional value. Right? So you have you can have a fraction of a cent, right? And in finance, that that often plays out that way. So for the region, should we write it like in terms of like dollars or in terms of um, like with the third decimal? Third decimal, unless they ask you specifically, if they say round to the nearest cent, round to the nearest dollar, then you can disregard the whole mm -hmm. the three decimal places thing. Thank you. Right? Because it's like the the angle of elevation of an object increases at a rate of 1.526 degrees. What's wrong with that? That's very precise. Right? Over long distances, of even the tiniest fraction change in, in an angular measure has astounding implications when it comes to the the span of the angle right so let's talk you talk about like uh you know like i don't know how many people are into like sci-fi stuff but especially star wars even the slightest miscalculation we'll find ourselves in the middle of a a, a, a black hole or a, a neutron star you know like slightest miscalculation what do you mean by slightest those are those decimal values all right, so we, we give three, three significant digits because statistically there is not much significance between the third digit and the fourth digit, but there is a, a substantial difference between the second digit and the third digit in terms of accuracy of computation. And for more on that, take my statistics classes in the future. Um, so anyway, that's all we need to do for that one. You just got to kind of know the rules of the game, all right? Ben bought a new car for $15,000. As he drove it off the lot, his best friend Tony told him that the car's value just dropped by 15% and that it would continue to depreciate 15% of its current value each year. If the car's value is now 12750 according to Tony, write a function that models the value of Ben's car two years after driving it off the lot. All right. So, that that initial fifteen thousand is kind of um, a distraction. It's, it's extraneous information because what we're assuming here is that Ben believed Tony, and that the minute the car drove off the lot, it is now it's lost fifteen percent of its value. All right, and now its value is twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty. So when we write our model, we would say y of t is equal to 12,750, it's depreciating still at a rate of 15% of its previous value for each subsequent year, all right? The depreciation, it's another way of saying decrease, all right? So one minus 0.15 still to the T power. All right. Now, in terms of time here, we want to just be thinking about what time represents its T years. But the starting point is as they're driving. They're already off the lot. Time T equals zero. Now the clock starts. A year later, what's its value? A year after that, a year after that, and so on. All right. What they want to know is five years down the line, Y of five. I'll do this one the other way. So you could just simply type in 12,750 
times 1 minus 0.15 raised to the, uh, the fifth power, all right? So you wouldn't have to get into typing it in as an equation to go to the table. The benefit of doing it in a table form is if you have to make multiple computations and also if you have to make a graph. We saw making graphs yesterday. So there is, there is value there, all right? So hit enter, you get your result, 5657. 0.243, which would be approximately its dollar value. So 56, 57, 0.24 if we're going to the nearest cent. But they could also say to the nearest dollar, to the nearest thousand dollars. That would be weird. I, I very rarely see that come up. But you know, I have seen them ask. Uh, ask you to round it to the nearest quarter, right? So the nearest 25 cents. They, sometimes you just throw weird rounding rules in there, right? Just to see if you know how to round, all right? So coming up with a function shouldn't really be that bad because it really is just a matter of just pulling the information from the problem and then making a statement of what the, the model is, specifically, you know, explicitly, and then uh, running a computation, all right? So, you know, the, the next problem is along the same lines. All right, a rare coin appreciates at a value. So appreciates, I, we just talked about depreciate. Appreciates as a, as a measure of growth. The initial value of the coin is $500, after how many years will the value cross the $3,000 mark, right? So, but, and then, you know, show the function that will model the value of the coin after two years. All right, that, that's all well and good, but this is an instance where we need to now solve for the value of time, which is infinitely more complicated, right? Because, well, it's only infinitely more complicated now because we don't know the analytic skills, the, the by hand skills to be able to pull that off. So we're stuck with strictly a calculator approach on this. All right, there's a, you know, I mean, you could do a trial and error if it's multiple choice, maybe you stumble on the right choice because it's clo closest to the one that you, you tried and worked, all right? But if we come up with a function, y of t, start off with the initial value, the a value is 500, we know it's growth, so one plus. It's at a rate of 0 0.052. Just be careful with the zeros. You know, when you're converting, it's number one mistake in this topic. When you're converting from percent to decimal form, so very often 5.2% becomes 0.52. People forget the zero, right? Worst case scenario, take the, take the extra second and take that percent value and divide it by 100, all right? You know, most of us can do it, like it's not a problem, but weird things happen when you're taking a test. So 5.2 divided by 100, there's your decimal form, all right? Just play it safe. You'll have the time on the region, so no need to stress about that part, all right? Now, I want to know after how many years, so we already showed the function that models the coin, so that, that's good. Now I want to know how many years it's going to take to get the $3,000, all right? So what I'm looking for is the instance where y of t is equal to 3,000, uh, th uh, 3, sorry, $3,000. If these were algebraic functions, then I could set them equal to each other and solve for t. But we don't know a technique yet that allows us to get a variable out of an exponent. It actually involves something called a logarithm, which we're going to learn about in a couple of years. I was about to ask, are we going to learn this thing? Yeah, we're, so we're going to learn a numerical approach on the calculator, but you will eventually learn about logarithms. If you're, if you're taking GAP, I think you get it next year. All right, but if you're, if you're going geometry, algebra 2, you'll learn about logarithms in... Um, in um, junior year. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to type our two equations in. And just to save your, I mean, it's so weird, but it just feels more convenient to type in 1.052 rather than 1 plus 0 0.052. It's the same thing. So you could just type it in this way, or you could put the plus sign there. It doesn't really make a difference. So the more comfortable you get with this material, the more likely you are to write it this way. Just do that quick addition. All right. So then we have 3,000. So we're typing the two equations in. That's the easy part. If we just go to a zoom six, we're going to have a problem. And that problem has to do with the fact that this y value is 3,000 units above the x axis. So it's not going to be in the window. We need it to be visible. All right. I also don't really know what the x value is supposed to be. I don't know how long it's going to take to get to $3,000. If I did, we wouldn't have to do the problem. So there's two ways to handle it, but both of them involve the window. So you hit the window key, and under x min, x max, You're going to put in what we call a, a practical domain. All right, a practical domain. You can think about it as a reasonable domain. You could also think about it as a domain that makes sense within the context of the problem. None of which makes sense if you don't know what domain means. All right, domain is a set of all possible values for the x variable. All right, the x variable here represents time. All right, they gave us the initial value of the coin. Initial means when the time is equal to zero. So I can make the assumption that the x min value is going to be equal to zero. So I, I just put that in straight away. I have no idea how long it's going to take for the $500, uh, $500 to grow to $3,000. So the only thing I could do is make a guess. All right, so under x max, I'm going to put in something that I think makes sense. All right, and if you don't know, go big. Not too big. Like, stay within the, the course of somebody's lifetime, I suppose. But you don't want to go like five, five years. It right? might be the right answer, but it might cut short. We need to show an intersection between the two graphs, right? So if you come up with a value for x max and the intersection does not show up, then you need to go bigger for the x max. All right. So I'm going to go I'm going to go 20. 20 years down the line. All right. I'd like to think that $500 with a 5% rate of growth, $500 would grow to $3,000 in that amount of time, but honestly I have no idea. All right, and if that doesn't work, I'll come back and take another look. But then this is the part, it's calculator specific, but we don't actually have to worry about figuring out the Y min and Y max. Because if you just go down to, well, it's really either the Y min and y, or the Y max, hit clear, all right? So we inserted the practical domain, we're going to the Y max, I like the Y max. You hit clear, followed by zoom fit. So for Y max specifically, clear, zoom, zero. All right. What the calculator is going to do is it's going to compute the appropriate range based off the domain that we just put in. All right. So I hit clear first, right on the Y max. So I have a blinking cursor and an empty field for Y max. Then without hitting any other key, I go to zoom. You can scroll down to zero, or you could just hit the number zero. Some graph showed up. That's great. Not enough though. I need to show an intersection. So what happened here is I chose an X max that was too small. All right. 
So I knew the X min should be zero, but the X max, I thought it was 20. Not quite. So what I would do is do that process again, just with a bigger value for X max. So I'll try 50. Then go to Y max, hit clear, zoom, zero. 50 was enough, but it was, a, it was just a shot in the dark, right? I could have very well gone 25 and ran into the same problem. Or I might have overdone it and put in like 10,000 and everything was so smushed into the corner of the screen that it was there, I just couldn't see it. But I have what I need now, I have that intersection. I need the coordinates of the intersection, all right? Very calculator specific. So, coordinates of the intersection You're gonna go, you're gonna hit tra uh, second trace, option five, scroll to the intersection, hit enter three times. All right. So the second trace five process brings up the intersect function on your calculator because you could potentially have more than one intersection on your calculator screen we scroll to the one that we want in this case there's only one so that step may not be necessary and then we hit enter three times uh, that that's the weird thing it's like why not just hit it once it, it's the way for the calculator to identify which functions it's finding the intersection between and then it, it locks in based off of a guess that you make all right so second trace five, scroll to the intersection. So left and right arrow only, as close as you can get, hit enter three times. And now I have the intersection point, all right? So when the X value is 35.345, et cetera, the Y value is equal to 3000, all right? The X value represents time. The Y value represents money. So it's saying that after 35.345 years, it's going to reach the value of $3,000. All right. So T is equal to 35.345 years. Now, time itself is a continuous variable, which is, <laughs> without getting too far into statistics, we'll talk about that in the next unit. When you, when you talk about certain variables, you have the discrete kind, which are the ones where it's just countable, all right? So like how many desks are in a room, how many light bulbs are working in a classroom, something like that, all right? But then you have other variables that represent measured quantities that get more and more accurate depending on how accurate the instrument is that's used to measure its value, all right? So if I wanna measure a distance, I could use one of the, the plastic rulers I have in the back, or I could use a sensor to determine the length, all right? Same thing with time. If I'm just doing one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, I'm measuring time, but not very accurately, all right? If I get a stopwatch involved, it's much more accurate. So when I say 35.345 years, Unless they tell me to round, I'm leaving it to the third decimal place because that 0.345 has value. That, that would actually allow me to bring it down to, if I wanted to, to the nearest second, right? That level of accuracy, right? So we want to have the three decimal places unless they tell us otherwise, all right?